So welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman, and I'm pleased to be here to introduce tonight's guest, Barbara F. Walter. Political scientist Barbara F. Walter is the author of uh, Reputation and Civil War, Why Separatist Conflicts Are So Violent, Globalization, Territoriality and Conflict, and Civil Wars, Insecurity and Intervention. Uh, the Rohr Chair in Pacific International Relations at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and is on the editorial boards of the American Political Science Review, uh, the Journal of Conflict Resolution, and International Studies Quarterly, among other academic journals. Uh, Dr. Walter has received grants and fellowships from the National Science Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and the United States Institute of Peace. She joins us tonight with How Civil Wars Start. And, and how to stop them, a very important uh, part uh, of this topic. In it, she examines the substantial increase in violent extremism around the globe in order to explore the rising possibility of a second US civil war. A reviewer in the Washington Post writes that this book is a much needed warning that uses cross-national research to examine the United States and that it is a warning to heed I've been skeptical of the notion the, that the United States is on the verge of another civil war. Walter has made me reconsider. This is a book that everyone in power should read immediately. Not so coincidentally, that re review was written by tonight's interlocutor, Jacob S. Hacker, the Stanley B. Resser Professor of Political Science and the Director of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale University. He is the author of the Great Risk Shift and the Divided Welfare State, and the co-author of Let Them Eat Tweets and American Amnesia, among several other books. Uh, Dr. Hacker is a board member of the American Prospect, the Economic Policy Institute, and the Century Foundation. Uh, without further ado, let's get right to it. Barbara, Jacob, thank you both so much for being here, and the screen is all yours. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I was, I'm so glad you mentioned that I was uh, the author of that review because I was afraid that I would have to break it to break it to you, Jason. Um, yeah, guess what? Um, so anyway, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm pleased to be here um, for one thing because I love all of the words that uh, are on the screen here. Free Library of Philadelphia. Those are all good words, um, especially uh, public library, um, which are an important institution. Uh, in our society, and I'm so glad that they're hosting us here today. So I got asked to do this a few days ago, and I jumped at the chance because, first, I think this is a great book, um, and I and I and I hope that you guys uh, will all be getting it and reading it. And um, at least by the time we're we're uh, done talking, you'll you'll definitely want to get it if you if you haven't. Um, and second of all, um, it it intersects with a lot of the thinking I've been doing, but from a totally different perspective. So I'm a scholar of American politics. I've been really interested in the transformation of, of our politics over the last generation, particularly the growing polarization between the parties. And as I said in that review, I've, I've been pretty skeptical that the, the end point of this growing polarization is, is going to be violent conflict. And um, my skepticism is in part a reflection, I think, of some misperceptions about the nature of civil conflicts in the modern world. And so this was one of these chances for me to be exposed to another part of my own discipline. So, um, and in the process to learn a lot about aspects of American politics that for all the work I've done on it, I hadn't really considered in this light. So that's just to say that I'm really, I'm really glad to be able to be here and, and talking with you today, Barbara. Yeah, it's a thrill to be here talking to you. So thank you. So I guess uh, I'll start with uh, a kind of, uh, in it. I don't know if to say it's a parochial question, but it's a question about political science. So. Um, we are a discipline that unlike, I'd say, economics and maybe sociology to some degree is not as, is not sort of as public facing, right? I mean, you can all think of a few prominent economists, um, you might know us, um, but probably <laughs> um, you can't think of a ton of, uh, of prominent political scientists. And it's because I think the, the discipline has not put as much value uh, on, on this kind of public facing work. And um, I'm reminded that at one point, I was uh, sort of in correspondence with the great economist Ed Lindblom, who passed away a few years ago, and um, and it, and the question was asked of him by by someone in, in this conversation, um, did he have any regrets about uh, you know his career? And he said, well, 
said, first, if, you know, if I was doing it again, I'd learn to dance better. And then he said, second, <laughs> which is a good answer, I have to say. Now I, now I want to know him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the second thing he said is I would read less political science, um, which was a real like dagger to the heart. So, um, so this is a really readable book, unlike some of the work in our discipline. But tell us a little bit about why you wanted to write a book for a, for a broader audience about uh, work that, you know, scholarly work that you've yeah. been doing for a long time. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm a kid of Im immigrants. My mom didn't go to college. My parents started a tiny company in Yonkers, New York. They were scrappy. They didn't have a lot of money. Um, they really struggled to pull the money together to, to send. There were three of us, um, my siblings and I, to college. Um, and they certainly were not supportive of me going and getting a PhD in political science because they needed money and they worried that, that I would never be able to support myself. But what really drove me from the beginning um, was, was problems. Um, you know, we talked a lot about world affairs every dinner growing up. Um, and we, you know, my, both of my parents lived through World War II. Um, and it was just front and center in, in our focus. And, and I, I just wanted to, to figure out solutions to those problems. And so I went to grad school and I did uh, my dissertation. And then my first book was, was called Committing to Peace. And it started with this, this puzzle, which was, geez, you know, civil wars, unlike wars between countries, don't end in negotiated settlements. At, at the time, 80% of them were fought to the death. And, and I just found this astounding and disturbing. Um, you know, civil wars are, are usually enormously costly. Like why would people fight to the death for sometimes for, for decades? And so I wrote this book um, that really figured out what the strategic problem was. And, and really it, uh, it came down to in civil wars, one side has to disarm and demobilize and they don't like to do that because it, it makes them sitting ducks for, for a surprise attack. And, and early on in my career, I started to um, be asked to go to Washington DC. Um, back then I was asked to, to do a fair amount of consulting on what to do in the former Yugoslavia, how do we end that war, um, and then in, in Somalia and Rwanda. And, and so I've always been a very non-academic academic, a non-academic -academic, non academic, um, because I, I felt like it, I had to translate. Um, our research for a broader audience. I had to, you know, make it so that that policymakers would read it and that that it gave them something tangible um, to use. And so, um, you know, in 2017, I got invited to be on this task force run by the U.S. government called the Political Instability Task Force. It was around since 1994. It still exists. I served until the end of last year. And it's job, you know, our job was to come up with a predictive model um, to help our government predict where around the world governments might become unstable and, and experience political violence. Now, in my field, it's so great. It's actually so great to be talking to an Americanist because, as you also know, political scientists don't talk to each other. Um, you know, I started in international relations. I did comparative politics. We never, ever look at the United States, ever. We, we, know, we will talk about Syria and we'll talk about Mozambique and Cambodia. We don't talk about the United States. That's what you guys do. Um, <laughs> and so I'm on this task force and, and, and on the task force, we were also not allowed to talk about the United States. <laughs> And, um, and that was fine because at the time it didn't seem like violence was, was a, a, a high, high likelihood here. And, um, and so we do this model and, and we sit around, we brainstorm about everything we can think of that might move a country towards uh, civil war. Is it poverty? Is it income inequality? Is it ethnic diversity? Is it how big the country is? How many mountains there are? You know, how difficult the terrain is? Um, and and we put over 30 variables in the model and only two came up again and again and again 
um, highly predictive. And it was not what we expected. In fact, we were quite surprised. Um, and the first was this variable, this weird variable we called anocracy. And that's a fancy term for partial democracy. Um, it's, it's a government that's neither fully democratic nor fully autocratic. It's something in between. So it would, to give you an example, it would be something like um, Singapore, although, uh, which, which, has which, which has elections and the citizens of Singapore love to vote. They vote in really, really high numbers. Um, but then the, um, the, the outcome is essentially preordained. Um, so there's no competition for, um, for who's going to rule Singapore. Um, and then the second factor was this interesting thing um, called, we called ethnic factionalism, which isn't polarization, because we included po political polarization, how far apart ideologically, um, let's hear in the United States, it would be the left and the right are. Um, it was whether the citizens began to organize into political parties that were based um, predominantly on ethnicity, religion, or race. And the goal was, was to get themselves into power, not to share power, but to really try to exclude all the other competing ethnic, religious, or racial groups in society. And so, yeah. yeah, so you're sitting there, you're sitting there, you're, you, I can just see the thought process working out. You're like, what are countries where you have where you have the, the, the democracy eroding and you know ethnic and racial uh, fractionalization occurring. Um, and so I, I want to I want to get more into the story of the United States, but before we do, I, I do want to sort of so you asked answered the two main sort of starting questions, which is why write a book for a popular a general audience and why write this book right now. Yeah. Um, but I thought for me what was most revelatory was this idea that our image of civil wars is like, yeah. well, you know, is really antiquated. So, yes. so when, when you're doing this research, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about how uh, scholars are thinking about civil wars today and what that means for thinking about the US. Yeah, so there's two things that most people don't know. The first is that we are living in an age of civil wars. We are, are now in a world that is experiencing more civil wars than at any time in modern history. And, and um, you know, back in the 1800s, civil wars were, were, were almost non-existent. You would have some, you know, the American Civil War, obviously, you'd have the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, but, but it, you know, it didn't explode really until after World War II. Um, and as you had an increasing number of independent countries around the world, and as these countries um, attempted to democratize, you know, along with that, you started to have more and more armed conflict. And on some level that makes sense because if you're opening up the political process, um, you're creating an opportunity for different groups to compete for for power, and if they think that that you know the window is going to close, they're they're gonna you know there's a there is essentially a power power vacuum that they're they're attempting to fill. So you know that the civil wars peaked initially in 1992 and then reversed themselves, right? You know, soon after the Soviet Union collapsed and, and you know, people who studied it, we all kind of breathed a sigh of relief. Oh, thank God, you know, this, this you know, the increasing number of civil wars that we're seeing is, is we're, we're done with that. We're going to enter an, an era of, of peace. Um, and that lasted until about 2002, 2003, when the trend reversed itself again. And the, the number of armed conflicts around the world has, has been increasing. And, and we've gone past the old 1992, 1992 peak. So, um, so that's the first thing, is that these things are happening more, um, uh, more frequently. And, and then the second thing is that they do look quite different than the old type of civil wars. They're not, they don't, it's, you don't see like anything like what we saw in the 1860s, two large militaries 
uh, conventional forces, men in uniform, dragging cannons, meeting each other on a battlefield where you have the rebel army meeting the soldiers of the government. That really doesn't happen very much anymore. And the reason it doesn't happen is actually quite simple. Um, governments and their militaries have gotten more powerful over time. Um, and if the government is really strong, so think about the Israeli military, think about the British military, think about the American military. Yeah. Like, would you want to take these, these militaries on? No, absolutely not. Who's, who's going to have any chance against them? Um, and so what you've seen happening is the, the groups that do organize for, for violence are, are using unconventional tactics. They're, they're using domestic terror. They're using guerrilla warfare. It's almost more like what we saw during the Revolutionary War than what we saw during the American Civil War. And, and the reason has a lot to do with how formidable their, their government adversary has, has become. And I'll say one more thing and then, and then I'll stop talking for a second, but this is, it's so interesting to me. Um, and, and I think it's so informative for the public. In 1860, um, the American military had 16,000 soldiers under arms, 16,000, that's tiny. And most of them were stationed west of the Mississippi to put down Indian uprisings. Um, if you were the Confederate States at that time, and the Confederate States had, they had militias that had been around for decades, well-armed, well-trained white militias that had been formed in order to prevent slave uprisings. If you're the Confederate States at that time, um, you know, it's not crazy for you to think, oh, we'll just meld all these militias together and we'll take on the US military. They, you know, they, it, it wasn't clear that this was a, a losing battle. And, and today, of course, with the American military, it has over 2 million soldiers. Um, you know, it's crazy to, to think you can take them on by, by directly engaging with them. And so you don't directly engage them. So, you target civilians. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me more about that. So, you know, to what extent, so, so I guess one question is a kind of technical question that you should answer very quickly, but it's yeah. basically, where do we draw the line between spat, scattered instances of terrorism and civil war, right? Like what, <laughs> what, what, maybe that's a, that's a like stock and trade kind of answer yeah. question for you guys. But, but before we get to that, like what, what do you see then as the threat, right? I mean, let, let's not cut to the chase. I mean, let's, let's not hide the, you know, yeah. bury the lead here that the book is making a, I think, a very strong case that we should be worried, you know, not yeah. freaked out, but worried about the United yeah. States and doing something to to address the threat. So where does that threat come from? Well, <clears throat> we we know that um, violent extremist groups have been growing here in the United States, and and they they really um, they they reached their previous peak in you know in 1996 with the I think it was 96 with Timothy McVeigh's attack on, on the federal building in Oklahoma City. Um, militias had been growing in the years before that. Timothy McVeigh was probably a member of one of the big Michigan militias. He had um, pages from the Turner Diaries, which is this, the, it was, it's like the Bible of the far right here in the United States um, that, that talks about, okay, if you're going to try to take on the US government, if you're gonna go to war with the US, US government, this is how you should do it. So it reached its peak. This bombing was captured the attention of everybody. The FBI was incredibly effective in infiltrating the groups and, and kind of dispersing them. And then we saw a surge um, in groups after President Obama was elected in 2008. And I've gotten a lot of, a lot of hate mail from people um, who've, who've been writing me and saying, you know, you talk about the far right, but you never talk about Antifa or you don't talk about the Black Lives Matter. Um, and, and the reality is that the data is, is very, very clear on where the growth is. In the 60s and 70s, most violent extremist groups in the United States were, were far left groups. They were the anarchists, the animal rights groups, the uh, radical environmentalists. So that's where that's where the threat in terms of domestic terror was. That's not the case today. All, most of the growth has happened on the far right, 
and it's two types of groups. About 65% of them are um, bet between 65 and 75% are white supremacist groups. They're by far the, the dominant type of group. And then the remainder are mostly anti-federal government groups and there's overlap between them. And basically their, their goals are not, they're, they're, they're not, they haven't coordinated yet. Um, so you do have hundreds of, of these small groups and they each have their own, uh, you know, different goals. Some of them do want secession. Some of them want um, uh, white ethno states. Some of them want to create chaos so that the federal government collapses. So, um, um, but, but they're, they're the predominant type of group that, that we've been seeing. And so, and maybe the first, on the first question, can I fairly say yeah. that for you, in this literature that basically, you know, there can be attacks, even things as horrific as January 6th, they don't amount to civil war unless it's a, a there's a high number of fatalities, it's an ongoing uh, conflict, yeah. and, and the, gov the government is involved, right? The government kind of has to be a party in, in a civil yeah. war. That, that, sorry to go into the details. Yeah, but. I mean, uh, uh, so the the big data set that everybody uses who studies civil war is actually called the armed conflict data set. And armed conflict is this big umbrella term. And underneath that is all sorts of different types of armed conflict. You can have insurgency, you could have coups, you can have civil wars, you can have revolutions, you can have grill, you know, it's a whole series of things. It's and, like the Briar's ice cream of civil <laughs> conflict. <that one. laughs> yeah, and every everybody, uh, you know, there's a lot of quibbling about where does every, you know, where do things stand? But mostly the conventional definition of a civil war is, and again, this is academia, so they people like gradations. There's a major civil war and there's a, a minor civil war. And the major civil war is, is a conflict, a violent conflict fought by um, a, 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 a domestic group against the government um, for political purposes that, that, um, that causes at least a thousand um, deaths a year. So that's major. And of course, if you think about that in terms of a really populated country like the United States, a thousand deaths in a year is, is, not, a, is not a lot. Um, you know, the, the attack on, in Oklahoma City caused almost 200. So you have five or six of those attacks and, and you reach that threshold. Yeah. Um, the minor armed conflict or the minor civil war only needs to um, create 25 deaths a year. Um, and I, in my research, I, I don't look at the minor conflicts because I, I just think 25 is so small um, that that could be one, you know, terrorist attack on on a cafe. And, and that's quite qualitatively different from the type of, you know, conflict that I'm interested, in, which is bigger. Yeah. Well, that's helpful because, I mean, to me, that was really revelatory. I was thinking about, as I said in the review, it, it, this isn't going to be North versus South, like the 1860s Civil War. It's going to be more like, you know, the Northern Ireland example, right, which yeah. is ongoing terrorist um, conflict. And, 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 um, and I, it seems it seems a lot more realistic and frightening. And, and one, one aspect of this that I I'd like you to draw out based on what you were just saying is this question of coordination. I, I was struck by how much social media has actually come to play a role yeah. in civil wars. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, the the expert on this is a woman named JJ McNabb. And I, I encourage your listeners and viewers to, to Google her. And she's been doing just fantastic work in this area. Um, collecting data about what exactly is happening, you know, amongst the militias. And, um, you know, we, until recently, there was no coordination, you know, you would have um, a militia training in the snow in northern Michigan, you'd have a militia training in a park in Orange County, California, you know, they were, they were maybe, you know, reading the same material online, but they were not coordinating their activities. They were not, um, they were not coming up with a common manifesto. Um, so it wasn't, it, it, it seemed like it was quite dispersed. 
And then Charlottesville happened in 2017, which was really this rallying call of the far right, where the groups that were there were coming, you know, these were a whole mishmash of far right groups <coughs> who did coordinate on that, you know, rally. And I think they were, you know, quite hopeful that this would have some effect. You know, to be honest, I don't actually know what effect they were hoping it would have. Maybe it would grow their ranks, or maybe they thought it would convince, um, you know, uh, Washington, D.C. to implement uh, immigration reform. I don't really know. But they did come together and they were chanting similar chants. Um, and and I, from their perspective, um, they Charlottesville was a failure for them, and 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 that's when you started to see them at least the more extreme elements of those already extreme groups begin to talk about accelerationism, accelerating the process of change through violence and civil war, um, and the reason it failed in their opinion was that there were all these videos of of the the people at this rally carrying torches and their employee their employers saw them and they got fired and the fbi saw them and they got arrested um and and you know they got deplatformed from from the social media sites where they were active and so they many of them saw that this wasn't getting them further the second time we saw coordination and in fact maybe even the forming of alliances was january 6th where the proud boys and the three percenters um and the oath keepers the three big big far right groups at this moment they were in contact they were coordinating um what they were going to do prior to january 6th and and that now is is actually really troublesome um because of course if, if you start to form alliances you you're a more formidable adversary and and um and they could you know do more damage as a result so one thing that I found really interesting in the book was this idea of sons of the soil yeah. movement, right? And so I'm like, what is in uniting these different groups? I mean, you have white supremacists, you have you know, anti-government um, people, you have people who, for whom, you know, it's sort of valorization of guns and, and military and sort of uh, militias. So in this idea that there is a, maybe a common element in the sense of, of loss. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, Sons of the Soil is a concept that's been around uh, um, in, you know, conflict studies for decades. Um, and it's, um, so we actually know who tends to start ethnic wars. Um, there's There's been over, you know, 200 civil wars since 1946, a major, you know, major armed conflicts. Um, you know, the, the almost 60% of them have been, um, you know, ethnic wars. Um, and we know who tends to start them. And again, it's a surprise for most people. It's not um, the most downtrodden groups in, in a country. It's not the poorest groups. It's not the, the groups that are most discriminated against. It's certainly not the immigrants who organize um, and, and try to fight the government. These are, these are weak, disempowered groups, and they often have absolutely no capacity to, to mobilize resistance to, to a government. The groups that tend to start um, civil wars are these sons of the soil groups. These are groups that had been politically dominant in a country and they either had recently lost power or they were in the process of losing power. Um, so it's, it's the groups that who see a region or a country as, as fundamentally theirs. They were the first people there or they are the majority of the population there. Um, they're the ones whose language is spoken, it, their culture, their, 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 it's their culture that's practiced, their religion that's practiced. And, and what happens, um, and it happened to the Muslims in Southern um, uh, Philippines, it happened to the Assamese in India, it happened to um, the, you know, Abkhaz uh, people in, in in, in Georgia, um, you know, they go from inhabiting a, a piece of land that is that they truly believe is theirs, and then there's in migration, 
there's in migration like in, in Assam, in India, it's right next door to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is overflowing with people. Um, and, and when the British were in India, they needed, um, you know, they needed farmers to farm the land. Um, and, and Assam, you know, had a lot of land. It needed civil servants who could help the British government rule. And they brought in lots of migrants. You know, in the Philippines, it's the same thing. So you see in migration that sl sometimes slowly, but sometimes actually quite rapidly changes the demographics. And in a way that the sons of the soil cannot stop. And they start to feel incredibly threatened or oftentimes, uh, you know, ambitious members of their group who, who, who don't wanna give up power um, who ha have power in the current system, but don't wanna lose it, they will begin to organize to try to fight off this, this demographic change. And so, and, and, and they tend to be relatively powerful because they, they had controlled the instruments of state. They, you know, they, they generally, you know, have the resources and the know-how um, and, and there's, they tend to also be protected in, in some cases because because they either still are in power or they recently had been in power, and they're the ones who tend to to fight. Well, I mean, on the on the and, and just everyone, I'm loving these questions you're putting in the in the Q and A, and I want to get to them very very shortly. But I, I hope you will forgive me for asking just one or two more quick questions before we go to them, uh, because after all, I I read this book, I wrote the review, and now I've got <laughs> this chance to talk with the author for one on one. So um, so. They are protected right now by key features of our political system, and so it sort of irony is that you're writing about this group that's feeling this deeply dispossessed, yes. and members of which, small numbers of which, numbers of which, but not enough of a, a no. small, a large enough share to, to, with given the number amount of weaponry in our society and, no. the, and the sophistication of, of this coordination that you're talking about could do real damage. And, and and but at the same time, we have a Senate that's tilted towards less populous, yep. um, white, more likely to be um, you know white majority states. Um, we have gerrymandering that's been done uh, by Republicans um, that has tended to accentuate you know the 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 biases toward the Republican Party at the state level. So you know, and we had the president elected in 2016 without winning a majority of the popular vote. Yep. And so you know. I'm trying to think about like what the relationship is between these two realities. One is that we have a system yeah. that still gives a disproportionate amount of power to um, to sons of the soil, um, and yet at the same time a sense of threat and um, backlash that is palpable and 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 as you say potentially quite dangerous. So how do you think about the relationship? Yeah, between yeah. These two? I mean. Um, part of it is people do see changes happening in their town or in the national level or culturally, right? I mean, think about the, the musical Hamilton, right? Um, this was about our founding story and, and all of the main characters were, were non-white. Um, you know, if, if that could be quite shocking to people who, who have a very strong sense of what the identity of this country should be. Um, you know, and especially what they're seeing is different from, from them, but part of it also has to be crafted. And, and I think the Republican Party, as you well know, has, has you know, been crafting um, an identity for itself to, to, to attract um, first, you know, Southern whites and, and then evangelicals. Um, and, and they're now in a, in a situation where um, you know, they've, they've built a party um, that is not in inclusive and, and is shrinking relative to other um, groups in, in society. And so they're in this bind where, um, it, you know, it, democracy, if, if, if our democracy is really one person, one vote, they can't win in that democracy. Um, and, and so they have to somehow convince their supporters Many of whom I have no doubt are, are patriotic Americans who 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 you know if you told them that we're going to get rid of democracy would would be angry and and so the the leadership that that's put themselves in this bind has to somehow 
convince these people um, that that the system we have is illegitimate, that the that the system um, is stealing their votes, um, and and I think that's that's how they're they're getting there. But but I think also what what you know well I'll I'll put I'll I'll wait. Okay, well no, but that's that actually gets to a question from and you guys are all gonna have to forgive me if I mess up your names, but and there's two Michaels, so I definitely can't just use first names here. Michael Monroney. Uh, oh no, wait, sorry. <laughs> I already mixed up the Michaels. I'm gonna get you Michael Monroney, but this is Michael Green's question, which is really about how how important Trump is in this story. Yeah. Um, both, and he says, did and does. So does, you know, what role the, did and does Trump play in inspiring the far right to violence and civil rest? And and I guess that can lead into, if, yeah. you know, it, into this question of like, how much is this a, a, a threat that you think will outlast Trump's presence yeah. on the political stage, yeah. however long that is? You know, I I think Trump is just a symptom of a larger set of phenomenon that have been happening for for decades here in the United States. And I think you could tell this story entirely without even talking about Trump. If Trump hadn't emerged, somebody else like Trump would have emerged. And if Trump is in the Republican candidate in 2024, there will be somebody who uses his same playbook. It might be Josh Hawley, it might be Tom Cotton, but, but they're, they're just symptoms of this, of what's this, okay. America is going through this enormous Democrat, demographic transformation. The US is gonna be the first white majority country in the world to go through it. But Canada is gonna be next, New Zealand's gonna come after, we're after them, then Australia. And it's expected that by 2100, the countries of Europe, the white majority countries of Europe will also probably transition to being less than a, a majority of, of whites. And, and this, this creates a, an absolute sons of the soil situation where, where um, you know whites are starting to see that they um, that they are losing out in this new system that you you know you have immigrants from India and China who are getting great tech jobs in the you know in the in the Bay Area and they're living the American dream that that they and their children who are who are living you know in a rural state are are not getting they they see that um, that their quality of life has not improved. Um, that, that, you know, white um, marriage rates um, have, have declined, divorce rates have increased, um, uh, you know, suicides have increased at, at, at levels above, above non-whites in this country. And so I do, you know, they're, they're, they're deeply resentful. They feel this loss of status. Um, they, they, they believe that it's their, you know, that it's their right um, to to um, to have a better life, to to set the tone in the United States, and 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 I think that's what's that's what's sort of moving at least some of them to to the radical right, and and you know I let's talking about Trump or you know this this transform this this transition happened really starting in 2008, long before anybody thought Trump, you know, people laughed back then if you had told them that Trump was going to be president. And I do think that the election of an African-American president really shocked many white Americans. And then uh, Obama's first cabinet was majority non-white. And, and, I, and I think that there is... It, it did create this, this sons of the soil dynamic where they're just like, what is happening to our country? This is not our country. It's being taken over and taken away from us and we have to do something about it. So, uh, sorry, I was just getting a note about, um, about our plan for the evening and, and we still got a lot of time. So, um, so I was just gonna, and that, that leads in actually really naturally to a question that comes up with a lot of folks here because um, you've talked about social media and the those who could be mobile those who are mobilizing or could be mobilized to participate in violence but i wonder if a lot of people are just interested in the more general media landscape which kind of fits in too with thinking about how trump was able to 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 gain power and 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 um and and attract you know substantial support um within the electorate i'm wondering how you think about 
the broader media landscape, maybe yeah. Fox News in, in this. And, um, and one question, I guess it has to do with the relationship between those who actually uh, carry out violence and those who sort of either sanction it or look the other way, if there's you know, a right way to think about that relationship, right? Because, and to what extent you're seeing the, there are a kind of shift in attitudes within the United a broader shift in attitudes within the United States, at least among, um, you know, Republican allied yeah. voters. Yeah, I, the way, um, you know, we tend to think about it, people who look at, at conflict and, and how it starts is, you know, the average person doesn't want war, they don't want to fight. Um, you know, they mostly just want to be left alone to live a good life if they can live a good life. And they don't want war because, you know, these poor schmucks are the ones who are going to probably pay the costs of the war. Um, but, you know, you have these, these politicians or media elites, you have these individuals who want power and they're, they're willing, you know, some of them are willing to go to really extreme measures to get power. And, and we actually call them ethnic entrepreneurs. Um, Slobodan Milosevic in the former Yugoslavia was an ethnic entrepreneur. Um, he, uh, he was a communist during the Soviet era in, in Yugoslavia and he held power then. And then the Soviet Union collapsed and, and Yugoslavs could pick whatever government they wanted. And they decided they wanted a democracy. And, and Milosevic is in this bind. He wants to keep power but he knows that that average Yugoslavs hate communists and they know that he's a communist. So he's, he's also quite smart and savvy. And he realizes that the biggest ethnic group in Yugoslavia are the Serbs and he's Serb. So he starts, he, he grabs control of the airwaves, the state controlled radio, state controlled television. And he just starts just pushing out this narrative of fear and threat and change and 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 it's over months and months and months and and he manages to convince average serbs that if they don't form into a serb party um, regardless of what the ideology of that is and if they don't back a serb like milosevic then the croats are going to do the same thing and the Croats are going to come to power. And once the Croats are in power, they're going to throw all the Serbs out of their government jobs and out of the military. And then they might actually even start killing them the way some of them did in World War II. And, and it was really, really effective. And so what you see is these ethnic entrepreneurs, whether it's a, it's a Donald Trump or it's a Rupert Murdoch or it's a, you know, it's a, you know, a, a, a jo Joe Rogan, you know, they, they, they have figured out that if they could tap into people's sense of threat and fear, that they will follow, that they will have a, a loyal following who, who, who won't leave them. Because if, if, if your loyalty is based on your identity, there's nowhere else for you to go. If you're a Serb, you can't join a Croat party. And it gives these individuals um, a lot of leeway to do what they want and, and, and to gain, uh, you know, a lot of power um, as a result. And so, so propaganda is, an, is a really important tool for <clears throat> bringing your average citizen um, behind you in your quest for power. Well, first I wanna say I'm taking all my music off of Spotify after <laughs> hearing about Joe Rogan. There are so many great questions here and I, I I, I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to try to draw them together into a few broad themes, and 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 I think there's one that you know. I think let's let's take this one right now, which is you know pushback um, from yeah. those who feel like you know that that this is impugning an entire political party, and yeah. and that you know Republicans are very well uh, like are very likely to capture you know both the House and the Senate in 2022. What does this tell us? And um, and I'm not asking you to, you know, I, I'll yeah. just say for the record, like I, I actually find your identification, this is primarily a, con a problem that's riding on the rising, uh, emerging on the far right, com very convincing and, yeah. comport com and the evidence supports it. But I do think it kind of gets to just what you were talking about, which is to think about, um, you know, is, here's, here's, a, a, uh, here's one way to put it, which is to what extent does it take, is it gonna, is this 
conflict going to be suppressed to the extent that Republicans are able to, to do well in American politics? Is it, are we waiting for another Barack Obama? Or do you believe that, um, that now that sort of the genie's out of the bottle, it's not really dependent upon the reality of, of power relations and much more about these, these perceptions, which, you know, in the case of the 2022 election, I mean, 2020 election, right, the perception, the false, the false belief that uh, Donald Trump won is, is widely held, right, despite the fact that yeah. there's literally no uh, evidence to support that. So, so how do you feel like, how much does the real world matter in this story you're telling going forward? And, 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 and you know, how do you feel about, the, the, I'm sure you get these, this pushback. So how do you feel about this sort of point about what's the place of the Republican Party as a, as a, as a whole in this story? Oh, wow. That is, um, so, um, you know, there's, there's, there's one party. Well, it's, I mean, it's so party. I don't like to treat it as monolithic. Like I, when I think about parties or when I think about voters, I like to think of a spectrum like Republicans, there's, there's reasonable, um, uh, moderate Republicans, and and it goes all the way to to the most extreme. They're 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 vi violent extremists in in the Republican parties, and and it's the same on the left. You have you have reasonable you, you know Democrats, and then it goes all the way to to the extreme where you have you know uh, violent extremists on the far left. Uh, the difference is in in the numbers. Like it's all you know the the growth is really you know, almost all of it is on the far right. And, and it fits with what we know historically about who, who would mobilize during these times of, of, of transition. Um, it's, you know, it's not going to be um, the, you know, the, the, the mishmash of different groups on the left who, who actually, when you think about what they're, they're, they're in a strategically good position all they have to do is wait, <laughs> you know, time is on their side. Every year there's fewer and fewer whites as a portion of the population and more and more non-whites. Um, and, and the opposite is true for whites. So, so we, we know that the growth in militias is on the far right. We, we know that the hate crimes are on the far right. We know that the incidences of domestic terror are predominantly on the, on the far right. Um, and then, a separate issue from that is what the nonviolent extremists or, or the, the, you know, what the more moderate Republicans are doing. And, and I mean, I think this is it, to, to most people's surprise, they, they're doing a whole series of really undemocratic things. Um, and, and so they're, they're working within the system, which is different from, from, you know, um, you know, the, the accelerationist groups it's quite you know it's not the same as what the proud boys are doing um they're working within the system but what they're really trying to do is they're trying to cement in minority rule or at least they're they're they want to create a system that will allow them to continue to win elections even if they don't have a majority of of americans supporting them and and, and that is, that's unraveling our democracy. And again, if I go back to the task force, you know, every year the, the United States remains, it, you know, it, it dipped into the inocracy zone during, by the end of the Trump era, it's, it's now out of it, but it could, you know, it could dip back in pretty easily. Every year the US is an inocracy and has one of its two main parties essentially acting like an ethnic faction the risk of, of, of political violence is, is almost 4%. That doesn't seem like a lot, but it is. That means if those two features continue for 30 years, the risk is over, over 100%. Um, and, you know, and, and so it's like smoking. If I started smoking today, my oh, risk of dying <laughs> yeah, is low, but in, in 30, 40, 50 years, it would be quite high. Yeah, so that's a sobering thought, um, and it makes me think that it's pretty important to address this uh, challenge. And yeah. you have some ideas for how to do that in the book. And um, and I just want to say, like, to I really these are these are great questions, and I I wish I could get to more of them. I mean, there are now twenty seven in the uh, in the queue, um, but I do think for all of us probably the number one question is how should we 
how should we understand the challenge we face, right? So what, what do you think are the both the most effective and, and perhaps sort of tempering that with some sense of, mm -hmm. of what is the most realistic of yeah. things we could do? You know, if you had a, this is a question I hate because people always ask me that when I talk about my work, it's like, well, if you had, you know, one, if you could do one thing, what would it be? But maybe at least, yeah. you know, think about what are the few things that would be most effective yeah. and, and, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about how, how likely they yeah. would be to occur. I mean, in an ideal world, it would be strength in our democracy, but, but we're not going to be able to do that because the Republicans have no incentive to do that. They're going to be hurt by reform. And the Democrats, we now know, don't have the vote. So the, the, the best, the ideal solution is off the table. You know, I think there's three things. One, you know, simply knowing what these two warning signs are is really important. By the um, way, you, we've got, I know what the two warnings are saying, we've talked about it, but it, there is a question in the chat which would like us to define more precisely what anocracy is. So, okay, yeah. yeah. So Anna, if you think about, um, you can have all sorts of different governments from negative 10, which is the most autocratic government. This is North Korea, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, to the most democratic, which is plus 10. This is Denmark and Iceland and Canada. Anocracy are those that go from negative five to plus five. They're in, in that middle zone. They have some features of democracy, but you know, for example, they might have a president who has very few checks and balances on his or her power. Right, okay, so, and then the other is this, this growing, well, not just polarization, but this like factionalization that is, is occurring where there's like all the alignments are, are getting subsumed within this kind of ethno-religious yeah. slash racial conflict. Okay, so then, where yeah. do you see the two warning signs? What what should we do? Um, and you know, you know, simply having Americans aware of it and talking about it. Like I, I've been writing this book for for the last few years, and and nobody was talking about it. Nobody wanted to hear it, and people just dismissed it. It's not possible. So even the fact um, that we're having this conversation is huge because people people I think are less likely to be complacent, to think, oh, well, you know, our democracy has weakened a bit, but, but boy, we're a long way from Iran, so we don't have to worry about it. And one of it is, no, 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 actually this middle zone is, is really, is really dangerous. And you know, the second thing, regulate social media. That's probably the single easiest thing we can do. The five biggest tech companies in the world are all U.S. companies, and and I'm not talking about you know you know control information. Like let people put whatever they want online, but don't create recommendation engines. Don't create algorithms that take the most incendiary, the most hateful, the most fear mongering type of of information and 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 disseminate it wider than than information that's that's calming and positive and and more likely to bring a society together that's that would be a, a a really pretty easy fix and and there's a lot of smart people who used to work for places like you know google and facebook who've been who've been giving very specific recommendations on how you do that and then you know i the third is i'm a huge advocate of peaceful protest um there's a woman at the kenny school at harvard erica chenoweth who's done you know, who spent her life studying uh, peaceful protests. And, and what she finds is it's incredibly effective in, in getting the attention of governments, both democratic and undemocratic, and getting them to, to institute reforms. You know, politicians uh, would prefer to have people stay in their houses and just kind of blindly follow along. And, and if you have mass protests day after day after day, and whether you're protesting against, you know, um, um, voter suppression or you're protesting against, you know, attempts to concentrate power in the executive branch, or you're, you're protesting um, the fact that, you know, we had uh, an insurrection in the Capitol and, 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 you know, the reaction by, by the gut, by at least one party is really shocking. It's, it's hard for politicians to ignore that. If you, you know, think about Tunisia and, and Egypt, these were deeply authoritarian um, governments, their leaders had been in power for decades, and it, it took just a few weeks of massive protests. And 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 both Ben Ali and Mubarak, um, they left. Um, and so you could just imagine how effective this this could be in a democracy where our politicians really really do have to take into account what the American people want.
Well, that that's actually a pretty optimistic note. And I definitely don't want to leave people feeling as if this is a a hopeless, um, a hopeless situation. I, one of the things I really appreciate about, about the book is that you spend a long time talking about things we could do. Um, let me ask you this sort of closing question, which is, which is related to that, which is, you know, do you feel as if, and, and maybe this is a little bit too self, self-referential, but do you feel as if the, the book might be making a difference? Do you, do you see, act, act, do you see for the book and, and other people who are making this argument, you know, do you see that changing how policy is being done or more awareness of the problem and, and, um, and sort of what do you recommend besides peaceful protest to citizens in terms of encouraging their pub- public officials yeah. to pay more attention? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, Jacob, I really don't know if this is gonna have an effect or if it's just gonna be, you know, uh, the, the conversation du jour for a month or two and then it will go away. Um, I, I do think, though, that that some of these important concepts, like like the danger of anocracy, like the the danger of ethnic factions, um, like this this larger phenomenon that we know about sons of the soil, will stick with people, and and at least they'll have, you know, some framework to understand what is oftentimes a really complex problem. So it gives them entree to to understand it. Um, but, you know, one other thing that people could do, uh, you know, of course, is, is vote. The 2020 elections, as you know, had really, really high turnout. Um, uh, you know, the Republicans did an amazing job on the ground and and they brought out, you know, millions of voters um, uh, and, and they still lost. And even with this historically high turnout, almost 80 million eligible voters didn't vote. Uh, you know, that could, that could be a game changer. Um, you know, those people did vote. Even if you, even if one party does try to suppress the vote and make it more difficult and, and do, you know, all sorts of things, you know, people, you know, they can still go out and vote. They'll have to persevere. They'll have to, you know, stand in line. But, but you know, if 80 million people, you know, vote, that's going to change the composition of the House and the Senate, and maybe we will get reforms. Well, I, so, you know, I hope that that's the case. I, I really would love to see people reading this book, and I'm glad to see so many on this, uh, on this webinar. Um, I'm really grateful to the Free Library of Philadelphia for making it possible. I'm really grateful to you, Barbara, for writing this book and grateful to all of you for these many questions. Though I must say, um, uh, if my students asked as many questions as this, my lectures would never end. And so thank you all. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, but please do read the book and you know, please do, um, do, what, do what Barbara said, get out there and vote and make your voice heard. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jacob. I really appreciate it. Such a pleasure. Happy teaching. I know <laughs> yeah, Barbara's off to teach. It's uh, she's got West Coast time. So I have a I'm three. Just... Hour, I have a three hour class right now. So. All right. <laughs> well, thank you again for giving us some time. Yeah, my pleasure. Bye, everyone.